Hello, readers and writers. I am Anthony L. Manna, otherwise known as Professor Grandpa Tonio, the book guy and the writing guy. And I am here today to read to you from my latest book, Lucas and the Game of Chance. Today is episode number 11. All the other episodes you can find on my website at anthonymannabooks.com. M-A-N-N-A, anthonymannabooks.com. In the media section there, you will find all the other recordings I've done. This is the 11th and... I am announcing this is the last because we have come to the end of Lucas and the Game of Chance illustrated by Donald Babish. Let me tell you a little, a little bit about the story. Lucas and the Game of Chance is the story of a flute-playing boy who befriends a mysterious talking, dancing snake. The snake bestows fortune and favor upon Lucas, but some years later, tempted by greed and pride, Lucas loses all his riches, even his family. He now must embark on a treacherous journey filled with suspense, and intrigue to find destiny, sun, and moon. The trek to destiny's kingdom is terrifying. The strange souls Lucas meets along the forest path threaten his endurance and his will to survive. He trudges on. He will beg Destiny, Sun, and Moon to forgive him for his foolishness at gambling away his family and his riches in a game of chance, a card game, no less. Destiny, Sun, and Moon will surely allow him to reverse his misfortune, restore his honor, and win back all that he loves and treasures, won't they? We'll see. We will see by the end of Lucas and the Game of Chance today. As I read, try to think of this day for Lucas is the day of reckoning. Lucas returns to his seaside village where he'll wager a bet with the merchant the merchant to whom he gave his family and his riches, all that he owns, in a game of chance. Will he win back all that he treasures and loves? We'll see, we'll see. Soon enough, Lucas was standing at the entrance of the cottage he had shamefully gambled away. He raised a trembling hand, ready to knock, but suddenly stepped away from the door. He drew in a deep, quivering breath, stepped up to the door, and pounded on it three times. Each blow was louder than the one before it. Lucas smiled at the lady, who opened the door a few inches at a time. She narrowed her eyes to scrutinize the caller and returned the smile to see Mr. Lucas standing there. Mr. Lucas was the gentleman she had worked for before becoming the property of the ill-tempered merchant. Seconds later, the merchant's portly presence filled the doorway as a blast of wind rushed by. The merchant steadied himself, tilted his head slightly to one side, and gave his visitor a devious grin. What's at stake? 
the merchant asked as he directed Lucas to enter the cottage. At stake, Lucas asked, distracted. He caught himself scouring the entranceway and beyond it for any sign of Thera, his wife, and the children. A bet, sir, a wager, the merchant insisted. For what other earthly reason would you have dared to pay me a visit if not for me, me, to take my chance at winning back all that I have lost to you? Lucas blurted. His anger about his own foolishness took him off guard. He tamped down the feeling with clenched fists. Ha! We shall see, sir, said the merchant. A smirk creased his face. He led Lucas to a cushioned wooden chair next to a table and invited him to sit. He took a seat directly across from his visitor. Lucas placed his elbows on the table and glared at the merchant. He leaned closer to the man and laid out the terms of the wager. If I win, Lucas proposed, everything and everyone I gave over to you will roll back to me, of course. He spread wide both his arms as though embracing all that he had lost in that devastating card game. Of course, of course. And if I win, the merchant asked, you keep all that I handed over to you and as many gold coins as will feed a goat's feeding trough, Lucas said while jingling the coins in his satchel. And you, sir, You'll take me for your servant to boot. Am I to believe that you are a man of means so quickly acquired following your loss? Asked the merchant, facing Lucas down with suspicion. He slowly rubbed his palms together. As befits my honor, replied Lucas. And what of the contest? asked the merchant. At cards, no doubt. Lucas looked fixedly into his rival's eyes and asked, Sir, from which earthly direction does the sun first appear each day? A pardon? The merchant responded, shrugging his shoulders and cupping a hand to his ears. The sun, sir. From which direction does it rise? repeated Lucas. Why do tell, sir, where else but from the east? responded the merchant smugly. You see, esteemed merchant, it has been revealed to me by powers far beyond my own that we will see the sun begin its journey from the west on the next cloudless morning, Lucas announced in a firm and steady voice. So sure am I that the sun will make its appearance from the west. I am prepared to prove myself right at the risk of losing a hoard of gold coins to win back all that you have rightfully seized from me. Well then, if you truly believe you have gained the wisdom to question nature's laws, asserted the merchant, I'd be a fool not to play along with this preposterous scheme of yours, wouldn't I? The merchant leaned in closer to Lucas and spoke. Yes, yes, of course, he said. Let's settle this ridiculous wager in the village square the next day that dawns with clear skies. Indeed, we will gather to watch the sun spread its first rays across the eastern horizon, of course. The merchant stood, grabbed onto his chair, and shoved it aside. He pointed Lucas to the front door, opened it, and motioned him to leave. As soon as the door closed... Lucas heard the merchant roaring with deep 
throated laughter. Lucas cringed at the sound and took a few brisk steps away from the cottage. Once outdoors, Lucas wandered a while through the grounds. He prayed to catch a, even a glimpse of Thera and his son and daughter. When he found not a trace of them, he moved on down the path with an aching heart. And so it happened. At dusk, on the third day after Lucas's return, a sliver of moon appeared from behind a thin, thin cover of scattered clouds. The moon's appearance held the promise of morning sunlight. By now, the merchant had spread word of the wager to every villager he had met along the way. He invited each and every one to come to the village square the next morning that dawn with clear skies. There, the villagers would catch sight of their, one of their neighbors, Lucas by name, where he would become the laughing stock of the entire island. They would observe him falling prey to his foolhardy claim that the sun would appear on the island, not from the east, mind you, the course it had taken since its creation. Oh no, our wise sky gazer was predicting that our old day star was about to cast its rays from the western horizon. When that morning came, with the first signs of a new day dawning, a large crowd of islanders had already been milling about the square. A few vendors were making their way through the square with their carts. They called folks to sample their delicious sweets, fruits, and flavored drinks. In the center of the square, Lucas and the merchant took their places a short distance from each other on a makeshift wooden platform. The merchant surveyed the eastern horizon. He laid his arms across his chest and smiled. Lucas paced from one end of the platform to the other. He scanned the skyline from east to west and rubbed his hands together. Each of his breaths came in deep and heavy sighs. Oh, fate of my fate. What chance is there that so miraculous a change in the sun's course could ever happen here in these skies over this humble island, Lucas thought. He looked out over the crowd. Some islanders had taken to rooftops with their children. From there, a few played at mocking Lucas by calling out landish directions for the sun to take. From the north, someone shouted. No, 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 it's the southeast, yelled another. The northeast, you fool, another shouted for all to hear. Islanders who had climbed onto the branches of an oak that shaded the fountain jeered at Lucas. They pretended they were students who had learned the sun's deepest secrets from their very wise teacher, Mr. Lucas, a famous scientist. They burst into peals of laughter. Throughout the square, the noise swelled to its loudest pitch. As the sky grew brighter, the islanders looked to the east. Suddenly, sun hurled a needle-thin streak of light out of a narrow break in the dark clouds. There it is! There's the sun! yelled a young girl. She pointed to the west and jumped up and down. The sun! The sun! It's waking up over there! The girl shouted. The girl's father took notice of her alarm. He looked westward, ran to a nearby stone bench, climbed on it and cried, the sun is rising in the west. Slowly, 
A hush fell over the crowd. As sun's glow grew deeper, islanders looked toward the western horizon. Cries of surprise competed with gasps of wonder from one end of the square to the other. A miracle, someone called. Others agreed, clapping and cheering. A curse! A curse! A very bad omen! cried another islander who fled from the square with her horrified neighbors. Above the clamor, the merchant could be heard condemning Lucas for using sorcery to disturb a natural wonder. The merchant grumbled, Blasphemy! Blasphemy! as he stormed out of the square. At that very moment, the merchant was ranting. Lucas raised his hands, palm against palm, toward the brightening sky. He let fly his whispered songs of praise to Destiny, Ilion, Luna, and Lambros for enabling him to reclaim his dignity. As soon as Lucas ended his prayers of gratitude, Thera, his wife, and the children ran to him. Papa, Papa, the children cried. They wrapped their arms around their mother and father while the two embraced. Reaching into a satchel, Lucas brought out the gifts of nature given him by the enchanted sisters, the dried-up river, and the raging mountains. To his son Petros, he gave the sprig of dried heather. He wished him days of good fortune. To his daughter Sophie he gave the myrtle leaves. He wished her a long and happy life. To his beloved wife Thera he gave the purple amaranth flowers, now dried. He wished her a richness of health from that day forward. When Lucas's and Thera's parents joined the reunion, the families together sang an earnest prayer of thanks to their God, their saints, and the spirits that watched over them. When the new day dawned following Sun's momentous performance, Sun resumed casting his energy from east to west. He once again took up the daily cycle assigned him since he first whirled into the galaxy millions of years ago. As for Lucas, Thera, and the children, for forty days and forty nights they opened their doors and hearts to their neighbors. With their neighbors, they celebrated their blessings with food and drink, and they danced to songs Lucas played on his magical flute. When the festivities had ended, every family member, young and old alike, pledged to desire nothing more than a future endowed with peace, good health, and a favorable destiny. For generations, islanders have told tales about the fateful game of chance that could have kept Lucas from his family and cast him into deep despair. They told of Lucas's courageous journey into the depths of the island's forest to beg for mercy and healing from destiny, sun and moon. They told of the clemency granted Lucas for his love of family. They told of the pardon Lucas had received for his devotion to Lambros, the mysterious talking dancing snake who had brought enduring happiness to Lucas and everyone within Lucas's circle of reverence and respect. They told of the freedom Lucas gained from Sun's miraculous passage from west to east on a suspenseful day long, long past. They told of the songs Lucas had sung from village to village in praise of the lessons he had learned from his loss and recovery. He had sung the song about pride's power to blur the boundary between right and wrong. Pride's lore, he had learned, could be weakened through acts of kindness and through sh sharing his wealth with unfortunate folk. He had sung the song of awakening to greed's bewitchment, 
greed he had learned could be repelled by living each day with deepening gratitude for his revered family, his good fortune, his blessed, renewed life. For as long as Lucas lived, he never once took for granted the happy, moral life destiny, sun, moon, and Lambros had allowed him to regain and savor. And thus, Lucas and the game of chance comes to an end. Some of you may be interested. The author's note. That's me talking about the fact that Lucas and the Game of Chance is based loosely on two Greek folk tales. And then I go on and give a lot of details about what I did as a fantasist, as a writer of a fantasy, to move away from the folk tales and create my own destiny as a writer. Let me put it that way. There's also further reading. You can go back and look at some of the folk tales on which I based this story, but grew away from it very radically in my retelling, in my reimagining it, let me put it that way. I want to leave you with a poem that I wrote called, In a Book You Can. In a book you can live royally in the ancient past, a king, a queen, move to a galaxy far away and in between. Join a protest, shout cheers of human rights, convert a bully away from painful strife. Swim through the depths of a restless sea, climb to the top of a rainforest tree. Ah, oh, what a landscape you'll see. Fly off on a dragon, a shape-shifting wonder. Survive a harsh battle, lament the plunder. Build a skyscraper, touch a cloud, win medals of gold before a cheering crowd. Learn about folks hurtful to souls from far, oh, oh, from afar have come. Meet kind folks who welcome others to their home. Enjoy a weird mystery. Let's fathom the deep buried clues. Hear the crowds cheer the heroes, drown out the thunderous boos. Open a book awaiting you there, long lasting treasures. Read a book, savor the savory pleasures. Share a book, a precious gift you'll give, a wondrous guide, oh yes, a compass for how to live by Professor Grandpa Tonio. Thank you so much for listening, watching, <laughs> observing, and I hope that you'll go back into the other episodes to get a sense of the, the growth of that story. I want to tell you too, and that I told you before, is that my website, anthonymanabooks.com, that's M-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. I want to um, alert you to the fact that I will be back and I will be reading from The Orphan, A Cinderella Story from Greece by Anthony Elmana, here I am, and Sula Mitakidou. Sula Mitakidou is my Greek colleague, my Greek colleague, who reimagined this story with me, illustrated by Giselle Potter. And so be it. Keep reading, keep writing, writers and readers, and enjoy yourself in the process. Thank you so much for being here. Take good care. Goodbye.